Welcome to another episode of Outliers. I'm your host, Daniel Scrivener, and we've got an incredible show for you today. On Outliers, I decode what the top 1% of performers across industries have mastered and what they've learned along the way. In each episode, I dive deep to uncover the tools, habits, and ideas that we can all apply in our own lives. And today, I'm talking to Jessica Hansen. As an actress, she's appeared on hit TV shows like Parks and Rec and Veep. And as a vocal coach, she works at NPR, where she helps all of NPR's on-air talent to sound incredible. In the lead up to launching Outliers, I was lucky enough to work with Jessica, and she helped me finally get comfortable and confident with my own voice. And that's exactly why I wanted to have her on the show. We go deep on how to find and own your voice, overcoming your fear of speaking publicly, why the best voices are often the quirkiest, and how to sound interesting, as well as why that's important. And we cover a ton more. If you've ever struggled with your own voice, this episode is for you. None of us get to pick our voice, but it's up to each of us to get to know it, own it, and harness its power. With that, please enjoy this vocal masterclass with Jessica Hansen. Jessica, welcome to Outliers. I'm so excited to have you on. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I wanted to start by maybe going back a little bit. And you and I haven't talked about this, but I'm curious for you, when very early on did you kind of develop that connection with your voice or with other people's voice? And was that something you discovered early in life? Was it something you discovered later in life? I'm curious where that this kind of fascination came from. Sure. Yeah. No, early in life, all I was interested in was theater. I wanted to be a theater actress and I was very... I was very drawn to the idea of dropping into another character. And I wasn't very good actually at thinking about how to change my voice for the character. I probably thought about what that character might wear or maybe some backstory stuff or even, you know, physical differentiations from my own natural way of carrying my body. Growing up, I think I just was really interested in the psychology of the characters and didn't think about the voice, I would say, very much at all. Until I went to graduate school, I think I was thinking about how I could use my voice better, but even then, maybe not necessarily thinking about really transforming my voice. And it wasn't until after graduate school, I started working with a theater company called Lean and Hungry, and we did Shakespeare and other stuff kids have to read in school audio versions. And I would work with the actors and help them to figure out how to separate their voices Because if you're playing two or three or four characters on a stage, you have costumes and body posture and all kinds of things to delineate you're a different character. But if you're doing it in audio, the only thing that you have to make it a clearly different character is your voice and how you're placing your voice. And so I think that's when I really started to crystallize where you can place your voice, how you can use different resonances, different pitches, flattening the voice, opening the voice to create really different sounds. And that's when I got really interested in it. And as that work bled over into other kinds of voice coaching, that's when it sort of became apparent that I knew more than I thought I did. You know how you get better at something and better at something and you don't have any perspective. And then you work with somebody who's got no voice training at all. And suddenly you realize, oh, (laughs) like what seems totally basic to me is a mind blowing revelation for this person. This is cool. I can really help people change not only this technique, but change how they feel in a boardroom or how they feel in their lives. People can feel more heard. People can feel stronger and more confident. People can feel like they've got control over the image that they're projecting vocally. So I think it was fairly late in life. I definitely was in my 30s, I think, before I started to really hone in on what does the voice do and what can it do and and where are all the places it can go and where can it open and how can we use that? And so you have that theatrical background, but then over time, like I worked with you in a setting where I was really working on my speaking voice, which was something mm-hmm. that I have never had a, a ton of confidence in. And so you're able to span that spectrum of everything from singing to theatrical to more of a speaking voice. Then you're also working at NPR. Talk a little bit about what that work looks like. You know, what does your work look like at NPR? Who are you working with and what are you doing? Sure. At NPR, the work with the people who are on air, mostly journalists, hosts, podcast hosts, correspondents, the international correspondents, 
also some of the executives, people who stand up at conferences and use their voices in a professional capacity, people who are representing NPR and need to have the ability to give a good presentation out there in the world. And it's a really, it's an interesting breadth of people. It's everything from people in their 20s to people in their 70s, men, women, people from all over the country, people from all over the world, different backgrounds. Some are coming straight from print and have never had any experience at all using their voices. Some have been on the radio for 50 years and they're locked in their habits and they really just need to get some new skills and break down the trenches that they've built that they're used to operating in. I typically work with people one-on-one the way you and I work together. When we were in the building, I would do some workshops, small workshops for 10 or 12 people so we could do a deep dive and give some people some skills fast. My wait list was like two years long. <laughs> so, so we needed a way to, to get more people in, have a few skills faster. And then sometimes I go in to a tracking session. You know, sometimes people will say, I'm tracking the story and I'm not sure what I'm doing. Can you sit with me and hold their hands a little bit, which is lovely. I'm always happy to do that. And once in a great while, they'll call me in for an audition. You know, we're auditioning a new host for All Things Considered. Can you come in and and tell us what you think of these voices? You talked about working with journalists. And one thing there that I think is so interesting is clearly there's the hard work of being a journalist. You've got to figure out what you're going to research. You have to figure out how to put this story together, how to tell this story in a really compelling way. But then alongside that, I always feel like, you know, whether it's especially news anchors, I guess, on TV, but it just feels like in journalism, there's a degree of theatricality that the best journalists you watch on TV and the best journalists that you listen to on NPR, they not only have a compelling story to tell, but they're focused just as much on all the tools they can use to really connect people with that story and tell it in a compelling way. Is that what you find? Do they immediately draw that kind of parallel and are they super interested to dive into voice work with you? Definitely. The performance level is key. Journalists, you're right. I mean, their training is about reporting. They're trained to cultivate their sources and get the story and to write the sentences and get all the facts in, in the arc of a story. And so often, when I start with somebody new, the first thing they say is, I've never had any training for how to use my voice. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. Because it's not in journalism school. It's not in J school. It's not in the training. It's not in the internships. And so, I mean, someday, if I have my way, J school will include (laughs) how to use your voice, how to tell the story vocally. And for those who are in television, as you mentioned, I mean, it's more than just being able to read the prompter. It's also being physically relaxed and engaged as well. Definitely, the folks that I work with, I hear across the board just an incredible amount of gratitude that they're getting this training because otherwise they don't know where to start. It's journalists, for sure, as an animal, (laughs) are one of my favorite creatures. They want to learn, they want to know, and they're grateful for anybody to, to give them a hand to do a better job. But also, I think everybody who comes to this work, anybody who's interested in learning about their voice, it's not just how you sound. It's your ability to communicate. It's your ability to express yourself and reach out to others. It's not just how you sound your voice. It's your voice. It's who you are. It's what you want to say. And if you have a tool that can help you express yourself, isn't that better? (laughs) So sometimes the folks that I work with, they aren't on air at all. They're people who just say, I've always been quiet and shy and I just want to be heard. And that is 100% a great reason to do voice work. Yeah, it's fascinating. I want to go back to something that you mentioned that you do at NPR occasionally, which is be a part of the panel of people that will listen to and and interview uh, potential hosts. And I'm curious there, one of the things I wanted to try to spend a little bit of time on is when you work with somebody, or in this case, where you're listening to a host for the first time, what are you listening for? Is it that you want to try to have this voice that's beautiful and perfect out of the box? Is it that you want to see that all the basics and fundamentals are there and you can build on top of that? And part of what I want to explore is how much of someone's voice is fixed and how much are they really able to grab onto and control and refine and improve? Yeah, that's a great question. Definitely 
coming in out of the gate with an interesting tone or a warm, relaxed quality is brilliant, but certainly not a non-starter. The ability of the human body to adapt I mean, we, this old dog, new tricks thing is nonsense. We can always learn. We, if we stop learning, we stop, we stop living, right? We're always capable of, of learning something new, whether that's kinesthetic learning or analytically or emotionally. The, what I'm looking for is a person who is willing to try something and has the flexibility to make the shift. If you ask for a change, can they budge even a centimeter, if their voice can move just a little bit, if you can move the needle just a titch, it means if, you know, just by asking them once, that it means that when we sit down together and I teach them some techniques and they start practicing things, then they can grow and deepen and open and range can expand. There's so much possibility if you just see a little bit of ability to, to move a titch. The other thing is, I think that's really important, is You mentioned sort of like the unique characteristics. And I think this is really important because a lot of people think that to have a good voice, they need to sound like something else. And my goal is always, how can I help you to sound like your best self on your best day? How can we unlock bad habits? How can we open up your voice? How can we free your sound so that you sound the best possible you and not like somebody else. You know, if people come to me and say, I want to work with you because I want to sound like so-and-so and and can you help me do that? The answer is no. (laughs) No, I cannot. I can help you sound like you and I can help you think about phrases and sentences and ideas and I can help you think about the colors in your voice and how you're using your breath. But I don't really want to spend time making somebody sound like somebody else. Imitation is not my art form. So when you said, if we're looking for something unique, sometimes that's great. Guy Raz has an instantly recognizable voice. And ages ago, people said, oh, he'd never be a host because he had this quirky voice. And it turns out the Guy Raz empire (laughs) is never ending. You know, it just keeps expanding. And he's wonderful. He's got his really intense, focused personality. He's got this readily identifiable voice. He's got endless energy. And the way that he listens to people, he looks like he is listening to your soul when he's listening to you. So... All of those things combine to make this little magical chemistry that is Guy Raz. But if you just listened to a tape of him and said, do you want that guy to be a host? Maybe people would say, no, quirky, weird voice. But I think it's the quirks that make us the most interesting, right? That's what's interesting to listen to is something different and unusual. The Japanese, you know, this concept wabi-sabi that the Japanese have, it's not the perfect vase that is beautiful. It's the crack in the vase that makes the vase beautiful. So I think people, the voice is very intimate. And I think people tend to be very self-critical of their own voices, especially because it sounds different inside our heads (laughs) from how we hear it when it's played back for us. So I think most of the time, if people can just say, I am what I am, and I'm going to embrace that, and I'm going to flaunt it, if we can do that vocally, then you get your best self. Yeah. No, it's an amazing kind of encapsulation of that. And I love that you brought up Wabi Sabi. I'll link to a few books on Wabi Sabi that I love in the show notes so people can can learn more because so, oh, there's a lot there that's really interesting. So I want to ask one more question about NPR specifically, and then we can take a big step back and kind of right. break down to what makes a voice. So a question I wanted to ask is, I think Guy Raz is a great example where he clearly has a distinct personality. And yet when you listen to a show, especially if you listen to NPR a lot, it also has this NPR quality. But can you talk a little bit about what that NPR sound quality is and, and how much of that is just the equipment or how much of that is kind of coaching and maybe even help people understand at least the way you think about what the NPR sound is? That's so interesting. This question always confounds me. <laughs> <laughs> the people that I work with at NPR have such a broad variety of voices. And I think because I'm always focused on this person could have more 
top notes. This person is flattening their voice. This person could use more pitch range. This person has a great sounding voice, but it doesn't sound connected. I need to get this person connected to the text. Or this person tends to mush through some words and then draw at other ones. And it's a weird pattern. How do we break that? I don't have an idea of what a cohesive, what an NPR sound is, except that I think the journalism has a quality to it. NPR as a media entity is different from every other media organization because it started with this long form and this idea, this mission of serving the public rather than what's hot and what's going to be sensational. So with the educational mission and the civility and respect mission of the journalism, I think it lends that sort of creates a foundation that maybe supports this idea of an NPR sound that people maybe are more thoughtful, you know, they take more time to consider. Mm -hmm. There's this idea out there in the world of being authoritative and having gravitas. And so maybe NPR has sort of some sound of being credible. Maybe there's like a credibility. But that doesn't mean that I don't get emails all the time of, I hate the way so-and-so does blah, blah, blah. Can you fix it? (laughs) (laughs) There's everything from Vocal fry, and not just the women. There are men on our air who have more vocal fry than any of the women. And then there are things like trailing off sentences and losing breath support. But it happens from people at age 20 to age 75. Yeah, I think you hit on it. I don't think it's a particular sound, but I do think it's almost a, a style or a feel to it, where it feels to me unhurried, thoughtful, considerate, Mm -hmm. like someone's truly listening, and which is a little sad to say, but that does stand out in pretty striking relief (laughs) in a world where people are talking faster all the time and trying to cram in as many points as possible. Yeah. So you work with men, you work with women. On the men's side, I know a lot of men have this belief that you need to have as deep a voice as possible. But can you talk a little bit about how men's and women's voices are different and maybe Mm -hmm. what they each uniquely struggle with. Yeah, or just how to think about that. Well, first of all, the wanting your voice to be lower and deeper is not limited to men. I have women all the time. The first thing they say to me in our first session is, I need to sound more serious or I want to have more gravitas or I want to be more authoritative. Mm -hmm. And there are women all, all the time pressing their voices down, and then they get that flattened quality because they're way down in the gutter of their voice. And so I actually spend a lot more time with women than with men saying, it's not about lowering the pitch of your voice, and it's not about speaking in the very bottom of your range. It's about integrating the bottom of your voice with the rest of your voice. So you have all of that warm, lower, deep resonance, but you also have your overtones and your brightness, and we want to marry those so that you're using your whole voice all the time. And then you have the options, because when you're doing this work, you find out where those places are and how to activate them. You have the option of saying, I'm just going to use the brightness right here, and I'm just going to use the darkness right here. And then you can just marry them both, right? Or choose any other tonal quality and do the same. As far as differences, I think I work with a lot of the same categories, whether it's male or female. I talk about how you're expressing the ideas. I talk about breath support and control and endurance. We work on variety of tones and emotion and being control of your pitch and how to create a sense of presence and how to draw your listener in. I think the differences in working with men and women are are very, very few. The actual instrument is different, but all the material is the same and all the approaches are the same fundamentally. The only thing that women have to contend with that men don't is biology that happens every month, <laughs> which impacts the <laughs> voice. And then that big change later in your 50s or so that women have to navigate how to re- when you're having these huge hormone fluxes, maybe men remember as an adolescent, the hormone fluxes have a real impact on your voice. And that happens again for women later in life as well. So I think that's really the only difference for me. For me, the approach is about how you're using your instrument and the differences are really nominal. So I have to ask, this is probably a stupid question, but obviously for men, we are going through puberty, at least the 
what seems to be common is kind of a lot of breaking in the voice and kind of the jumping up and pitch. And I know some guys later on in life that still have that quality, but it seems like that does line up to be one of those kind of teenage or going through puberty things. Is that what happens to women in their 50s when they're going through menopause? Or is it a different thing that happens to the voice there? It's a different thing. It's a different yeah. thing. And for boys growing, their voices are are deepening with these new hormones. And so there's this flux and there's this lack of control. For women, it's all kinds of, the estrogen is leaving the body. And so the testosterone has more room to play. And so women very often feel, I mean, they've got all this emotional stuff to deal with and all this physical ramifications. And sometimes it's just as simple as how do you breathe through a hot flash if you're in the middle of an interview? (laughs) But sometimes it's, you know, I feel like my feminine voice is leaving. And so how can we keep a woman's whole voice whole as she's moving through this transition. I have not had the distinct pleasure of working with adolescent boys as their voices are breaking. Not sure. Not sure I'm up to the task. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's your prime prime client. <laughs> <laughs> but, but once people hit the professional world, there are so many things that can impact what's going on in your voice from menopause to nerves, just flat out I see the red light blinking. I know the mic is recording to standing in front of a room full of 500 people to I didn't work out this morning. And so I don't feel as warm. How can I get warm fast? So, yeah, there are just so many ways that the body can impact the voice. And so really, the basics of my work are creating mindfulness. What are you aware of? Can you notice where you're breathing? Can you notice how you're breathing? And once you have the awareness of what you're doing, then you can shift that and we can play with, oh, well, what happens if you breathe into this place instead? Or how can you navigate this tricky situation, whether it's nerves or a hot flash or or whatever? How can we navigate this? How can we be mindful of knowing how your body and your voice work to get you through this smoothly or at least more smoothly? So you touched on this and I want to go back to it for a second because I think it's a universal thing a lot of people struggle with, which is controlling your nerves. And in those situations, whether you're recording audio, like I still get nervous before all of these interviews or speaking in public, those are all instances where keenly in your mind, you want to feel confident and you want to show up as your best self and you want to sound your best and look your best. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that I thought was fascinating just to connect a couple dots working with you is just learning that really to get the best vocal quality, you don't want tension. You want to be very relaxed and that your best voice is kind of the most relaxed, the most open, the most natural, the most expressive possible. How do you help people work through that and and improve that? And do you have any techniques that people can use or things they can keep in mind when they want to show up as their best self, but they're feeling that rush of adrenaline? That's maybe not helpful. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. A lot of it is mental. When we get a little bit nervous or anxious, We move into the reptile brain, the fight or flight part of your brain. And so there are a number, I mean, there are myriad breathing techniques for how to calm your nervous system and how to override that fight or flight or freeze response. And you can find them in meditation. You can find them in yoga. You can find them in voice work. You can find them in singing work. The one that I love the best that I think is the go-to for me, that I find most people can do anywhere, anytime. You can do backstage before you step out at a live event. You can do it even while you're listening to somebody asking you the question, or in your case, if you're listening to me answer it. You can do it as your producer is setting up the studio and you're getting ready to record something. It's the four, seven, eight breath. You breathe in for a four count. They say hold it. I don't like the word hold because it it implies sort of holding or gripping or clamping down. And so you suspend the breath for seven count and then you exhale for an eight count. But what that does, the suspense creates a stillness, which helps the mind be still. And then exhaling for twice as long as the inhale overrides the nervous system and tells your mind it's okay. Everything's okay. I'm safe. It returns you to that rest and digest brain and takes you out of the reptile brain. So it's super easy. You breathe in for four, suspend the breath for seven, exhale for eight. 
and it people do it once <laughs> and their faces are like, oh, <laughs> I feel so much better. Yeah, it feels better to be calm, doesn't it? <laughs> if you're not standing backstage or in a studio with a producer or a bunch of other people, the other one that I love is it's the simplest thing in the world. You squat, get down on the floor, spread your feet wide, squat, drop your head so that your back is arched. You're cutting off your front body. So you're, you take in a breath, let your head hang heavy like a bowling ball. You breathe in and you feel the breath going down your back. And your back actually has more lungs than your front. So when you breathe into your back, you're getting more air into places that it doesn't necessarily usually get to. And those lower lungs are connected to the part of the brain that manages decision making. So if you breathe low into your back, it helps you to feel more decisive, more confident. And that can also override those, those jitters or a little bit of mm, nerves for whatever you're starting. Some people, though, don't feel comfortable dropping into a squat backstage before they're about to go on onto a stage live, and I get that. So 478 is the go-to for anywhere, anytime. I love that you touched on that because that's the single best little tutorial I've ever heard. <laughs> 478 <Yeah. laughs> and 478 breathing, and it is, it's amazing. And, you know, I've also shared it with people that are going through, I don't know, what might be described as like a mild panic attack, or they're having mm -hmm. just this wave of nervousness and anxiety. And it is amazing because you'll start that 478 kind of sequence and you'll feel terrible. And, and yet by the last four counts, it's just this, this wave yeah. of relaxation and it's yeah. an amazing technique. Yeah. There's something about that eight exhale that's really, your body gets to the end of that, as you mentioned, and it's like a sigh. A mm -hmm. sigh is also one of the most wonderful things you can do for your body, voice, and mind. It's just a simple thing. You do the, take a nice big inhale and then <sighs> sigh it out. And you feel all your muscles softening and your throat opens and you're exhaling all that, the dead air, you know, it's that psychological mm -hmm. get rid of the gunk. It's great. So I want to start to, I guess, yeah, maybe dive in and talk about what makes a voice. But what was amazing about working with you and part of this was one of my motivations for wanting to do this is I just had no clue where to even start or how to think about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, you did such a good job of breaking down the qualities of someone's voice, stuff like resonance or enunciation or interestingness or presence. Can you just set up for people or, or maybe try to break down at a high level? What are those building blocks of someone's voice? Voice. And then we can go from there and maybe explore each of those a little bit. Great. Well, first of all, thank you. That's a lovely compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've hit them. You know, everything boils down to the breath. We always start with the body releasing the tensions and getting the breath moving. And once you've got the support of the breath, most people tend to use about 50% of your lung capacity. So if you think of that and think, well, opera singers, horn players maybe use 70%, 60%. You think of that and then, hey, what else can you do? If you're only using 50%, you've got so much more. So I always start with the breath, releasing the tensions in the body, moving the breath. And then we start to build resonance. Once you've got the breath underneath you and underneath your voice, you can start making some sound, putting some sound on that breath. And then where are you going to put the sound? That's when it starts getting fun. So the resonances can happen in so many different places. You know, you can have chest resonance or head resonance, which I think everybody is familiar with. But can you put your resonance in your nose if you want a brighter sound? Can you put it in your jaw? What does it feel like if you're moving your resonance to the top of your head? Can you put it all the way down in your hip bones? Where can you move your resonance? And then what kinds of tones do you want? Then we can start working with not just pitch range, but emotional tones, points of view, how are you coloring your text? Do you want it yellow or blue? <laughs> Do you want it pink or green? You can start with things like good news, bad news. This is happy or this is sad. And then you can move into things like curiosity, suspense, inviting somebody in, being sounding assured when... A lot of the journalists have to do a lot of bad news, and it can't just all be serious. This is serious. This story is serious. This other story is serious. You have to find what are the various colors there. Everything can't be blue. You have to have light blue and dark blue and indigo and turquoise, right? And then once we're sort of 
happy with all the freedom of choice that we have with our voice, then when you're sliding that onto text, then you, we can drill down to the specifics of phrasing, pacing, enunciation. Who are you talking to? How do you make this engaged and energetic without overdoing it? You don't want to sound like you're forcing anything. You still want to sound authentic. But that's when the fun, that's when you're juggling seven or eight balls in the air at the same time. And I'm saying, no, I promise it will all make sense next week. (laughs) Okay, we talked a little bit about those basic building blocks of someone's voice. Obviously, you work with a lot of people one-on-one, but walk us through, so you meet somebody for the first time that you're going to work with together one-on-one. You have these kind of sessions planned out. What is your process like for breaking down someone's voice and understanding where they can improve? And then how do you put together a plan for that? Great. All right. Now I'm revealing all my secrets, huh? (laughs) (laughs) So the first thing I do is have a phone call with them like you and I did, because I want to hear how people talk normally. Ask them a few questions about their background and their experience, both for the content. I need to know what the experience is, but also just to hear how people normally talk. When we're on the phone, you can sort of, if you don't do a video call the first time, I can't see the person. So I don't have any visual pollution. And I'm not also distracted by how am I also presenting myself. Just the phone call is pure audio. I get to hear how a person just speaks naturally. And then once I've sort of noted, where's the resonance? Where's the resonance not? Where do I hear tensions? Where can I hear, even in speech, is there jaw tension or is this person running out of breath? Is this person a fast talker or does this person collect their thoughts while they're speaking? Does this person have a lot of vocal fry? Does this person, whatever. Once I've assessed that in just normal conversational speech, then I run them through a little assessment, asking them to do different things. Can they meow like an annoying alley cat? And some people cannot. Some people say, meow, meow. (laughs) And it's like, well, okay, great. They can't, with that prompt, imagine or put their voice up into a really annoying nasal place. So maybe I try something else, or maybe I just say, all right, we'll see if there's another way we can get to brightness. Or I, I ask them to do, you know, can they do these lip trills that are magic? which you and I have done, I believe, right? Yes. <laughs> and so many people can't do just the fluttering of the lips, just the... <laughs> if you can't do that much, you can learn. It is possible. I have had students, clients who have learned, but it, it's a further distance. So maybe there's something else that we can do instead. I probably asked you to do several ridiculous things like bang on your chest like Tarzan. <laughs> and yes. Sometimes I ask people just to laugh and cry. If you fake a laugh or fake a cry, it gets up into that special little space that (laughs) right up here in your sinuses and your nose and your eyeballs. (laughs) And if people can place their voices up there, there's like a world of possibility. If people can't, then we have to come at it from a different direction. Yeah. So you broke down there some of the, what your general process looks like, what you're looking for. Now, I guess my experience working with you was it's really about then layering on and it starts with breath support. And then after that, it feel, and there's a lot of breath work that Mm -hmm. you do with clients. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of it I would best describe as like maybe mind body connection Mm -hmm. where it's very much like how can you be more present of restriction or tension in different places and where you're breathing and when your breath's about to run out so that you don't always have these You're gasping for air at the end of a sentence. And then you're layering on top of it. So once someone has those building blocks in place, where do you try to go from there? And what does kind of advanced voice work start to look like? Sure, sure. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, step one is you have to shed the tensions. You have to open up the bodies, get the muscles soft so that they're not in the way, so that you can breathe. And the breath is under everything. And so... Yeah. And then you can move that to the resonance in the voice. And then you move to the text. Then you're starting to remember how to keep your breath endurance and your specificity of your resonance and your placement and your sound and all of these explorations that we've done on words. And you won't believe, I mean, the brain is like, I know how to speak and it goes back to all the old habits. So building that bridge between the new exercises and putting it onto words, even if it's not even sentences, just single words, 
It's trying to, to break down the old habits and build a new habit. We're building the techniques. And with the mind-body connection, being aware of when I'm focused on putting my resonance in my face, I start clenching my jaw. Yes, if you start noticing those things, then you're onto it. And then you can work. Because once you realize, oh, every time I take a breath, I'm raising my shoulders. Yeah, you're cutting off your air supply. You're trying to take a breath in. And instead, you're squeezing your your throat. <laughs> so yeah, the mind-body connection is so critical. Just that awareness. And then once you sort of have overcome, I mean, it's never done. Work is never done, right? You graduate from high school, you go to college. The same is true with breath work and voice work. Once you say, okay, I mastered this plan that Jessica's given me. I've done my exercises every day for a month. I'm so good at these exercises and I'm learning how to put them on words. Then everything morphs, you know, then you start reading paragraphs and thinking, oh, well, what happens if what happens if I read this whole paragraph just thinking about soft jaw? I'm just going to let my jaw drop open the whole time. And I'm not even going to think about what the words mean. What happens? And then when you do that, suddenly you find, oh, wait, without that tension in the way, all of your meaning and in intention of the words and the content comes through because there's nothing to stop it. That jaw isn't impeding your speech. And so boom, there's so much more freedom. What happens when I noticed that I was leaning forward and so I was jutting my throat forward, so I was cutting off my airway? What happens if I get back in alignment and my throat is, my airway is all clear? What happens to my sound? Wow, I feel more confident. I feel more relaxed. I feel more powerful. So really, I mean, there's no end. <laughs> it's just a constant exploration. And once you've got a mastery of, of this toolkit, then you can sort of poke and explore and then come up with new tools. I love there that you brought up jaw tension because it clearly a, a part of your work is what is there that we can improve? What is maybe not there that I can add or help them flesh out? But then a big piece of it as well, too, is in what ways are they kind of their own worst enemy? And how can we get rid of some of those obstacles? Yeah, truly. And people so often don't have that awareness and just you can see it even when all the coaching is remote. I can see it in the in the computer screen. Somebody's mm -hmm. shoulders hike up when they take a breath or they do with the jaw exercise, but then when they're speaking, the jaw isn't opening anymore. But this is true of so many things. We hold in these these micro places, we hold ourselves. We might have tension in our middle back that we haven't paid attention to because we're so worried about our shoulder tension. And once you finally release the shoulder tension, you notice, oh my gosh, I'm doing this really weird thing with my middle back. I'm like clenching between my shoulder blades. And so once you release that, you notice, oh, I'm like gripping my own fingers. I'm making like claw hand. Why do I have all this tension in my hand? And so it's just this constant process of shedding, 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 shedding tension and building the habit of release, the habit of softness and the habit of openness. And it does get easier. I mean, you talked about like advanced level. It gets easier. You walk into the studio or you sit down in front of the mic or stand in front of the mic, I hope. And you say to your body, let's do a head to toe scan. And you say, oh, I can soften there and there. Oh, and my breath wasn't going into my belly. Uh-huh, and my feet, oh, my feet aren't on the floor. There we go. Strong, grounded feet. Okay, I'm ready. And even then, you'll get into some content that you start to think about. And as this cerebral society, you might start clenching between your eyebrows and get that little furrow above your nose, you know, that forehead furrow. And then you realize, oh, that furrow has now blocked <laughs> my voice again. How do I soften my face? <laughs> yeah, I want to explore one thing in particular. So there were some things that uh, after going through the voice work with you just really stood out as simple things, simple concepts that you could think about and have in your mind that could just help you have a voice that people want to listen to. And I feel like that is a, a big reason why I was drawn to voice work. And I knew I was going to be doing these long form interviews. And the thing I feared most was that uh, either as excited as I was, that that wasn't being conveyed in my voice and in the quality of the conversation. And then the other piece was 
that it would just be monotonous or it would be something that that people weren't able to engage with. And so some of the things that I took away of working with you was just really simple things like playing with volume, playing with speed, playing with enunciation, just making sure you're enunciating really clearly, and then things like interestingness. But talk a little bit about that. Like, what are some things, what are some concepts that people can maybe latch on to that if they're in a video call, and they're doing a pitch or a presentation to their team, what are some things they can have in mind just to make sure that they are communicating the emotions and the interest and the excitement that they're feeling? And and what are some techniques that people can use to be as interesting as possible? Yes. You do need to keep variety for people to stay interested because even if you're doing something beautiful, but you're only doing it on two notes, those two notes get tiresome. People's ears check out. The brain knows what to expect. And once again, we meander off into, what are we going to cook for dinner tonight? So yeah, changing pitch, changing pacing, using pausing effectively. When you just give a little micro pause, just a little lift before and or after a word, it sets it out for your listener's ear. So if I say, I'm going to go to the grocery store later, that's nothing. But if you say, I'm going to go to the grocery store later, people are like, whoa, grocery store, that's important. What just happened there? (laughs) (laughs) Right? So there are little things you can do with pacing and phrasing. You can blow through something really fast and then slow down to emphasize something. You can certainly think about putting a different idea on a different pitch. So if you're talking here and this is this idea, then maybe the next idea starts up here because it's a new idea. And so it comes to a different place. And then maybe the next one drops down a little bit more and maybe you slow it down. So yeah, absolutely. Everything that you just talked about, pace, pitch, tone, phrasing, all of those things can certainly, if you're giving a long presentation or a long talk. But I would say before that, before even thinking about how you're structuring the delivery, step one is to get your voice warm. (laughs) Don't go into it cold. Shake it out. Do some lip trills. Do some howling. Do some humming. Do some yawning and sighing. Get your voice moving. You can't just go in and in your brain say, I'm going to move my voice around. You have to open it up. You have to, no NBA player goes into a game cold. You don't park in the parking lot, go into the locker room, put on your uniform and start the game. You go in, you do the drills, you're with the team, you're passing, you're shooting. This is the same. Why would you not warm up your voice? Your voice is your instrument and you are a professional voice user. So get it warm, get it ready. And then you will find that it's so much easier to move it around. Step two, before you even think about delivery, is get yourself into a good position, especially with these Zooms. People, the ergonomic setups are all over the map. Oh, yeah. Terrible. And so people are, the chair is the wrong height for the desk, and the laptop is down on the desk and not at eye level. You've got to get your monitor at eye level so that you're not cutting off your throat. If the camera slash your screen are below you, you're going to tip your chin down. And then you've, I mean, you can hear my voice. If you're tipping your chin down, you're cutting off your voice. And then some people, to counteract that, will stick their collarbones forward to try to make that space so they can breathe. And now you've got like a little zigzag shape in your airway, which is even worse. So make sure that your hips are underneath your ribs and your ribs are underneath your shoulder tops and the points of your shoulders are underneath your ears and your head is balanced and your eyes are looking out to the horizon and not down or up. Either way is going to make your airwave, your channel go janky and you don't want that. And if you've got a warm voice and a clear air channel, then your voice can freely move and you can think about Should I go up or down here? Should I slow down here? Where should I take a dramatic pause for effect? Where should I get warm and low and close? And where should I get bright and far and excited? You know, all of those things are after you've established that your voice is ready to do those things and your air is accessible to you. Yeah, I I love that a theme that it feels like keeps bubbling up just during the conversation is 
mindfulness, you know, being aware of the position of your body, being aware of where you're holding tension or where you might not be holding tension and all the bad habits that we accrue. But it does seem like a big part of, I don't know, working on your voice Mm -hmm. or being able to sculpt the quality of your voice Mm -hmm. is almost just being in touch. (laughs) It's true. It's really, really true. And Sometimes you develop new habits, good habits, because you're aware, oh, I have jaw tension. And so you focus on your jaw and you focus on your jaw. And eventually you develop some better habits with your jaw. But that doesn't mean that ever the jaw awareness goes away. The mindfulness is everything. And in some cases, it's not the top of mind thing because you've practiced it. So you can get it to a place where the little mice in the back of your head just like hit the button when when you need to pay attention. Like, ding, something tensed up. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I love that. I've never asked you this. I'm super interested to hear your response, but what's a voice? So it could be an actor, it could be an actress, or voices that you feel really drawn to or that you think are really interesting. And maybe they're even at NPR, maybe they're not. But I'm curious, what are some voices that you think are particularly interesting or that you just love the quality and the tone? Sure. So people ask me this a lot. Who's your favorite NPR voice? Or, And it's true. I mean, we can all point to those beautiful sonorous voices that we just could drown in, James Earl Jones. And, and then there are the voices like Tom Hanks that just feel so comfortable all the time. Mm-hmm. You're just like, oh, that's my favorite sweater. I could always put it on. But for me, my favorite voices are the ones that completely transform. Kate Blanchett, for instance, is one of the most transformative actors alive today. She can, if you look at her and Elizabeth and you look at her in The Gift, there's no way you could even Hmm. think they're the same person. And yet, there it is. And she does that physically, but she does it vocally too. She has a mastery of her instrument that even Elizabeth from the beginning of the film to the end of the film is a completely different vocal person. She has such a subtle control over where her voice is and what it's doing. I just love to watch her on screen or on stage because her power, her control, and her subtle use of color in her voice, as well as everything else, is just mind-boggling. I love Kate Blanchett. That's the answer to that one. Kate, (laughs) Kate Blanchett. Mm. Yummy. Period. Full stop. End of story. (laughs) I love your description of Tom Hanks's voice because one, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. And that's just so true of his, I feel like his acting and his persona in general. But I think the other thing that's really interesting there goes back to your point that you want to figure out what that voice is, what the most interesting, most unique version of your voice is and not trying to sound like anybody else. Mm -hmm. And what's funny, just thinking about how you describe Tom Hanks's voices. I'm guessing you've never had a client that's come to you and said, I want my voice to sound like a sweater, like the f- your favorite homey sweater <laughs> that you want to put on all the time. And yet that's something that makes his voice just particularly fascinating. True, true. And we love to love Tom Hanks. And so, yeah, and he is a person who has a strong sense of self. He's relaxed and confident. He doesn't have one of those booming sonorous voices, but he is present. He is present in his voice He's relaxed in his voice and you can hear it and you're drawn in, right? Well, I am. I'm drawn in. I don't know about the rest of you, but I am drawn in. I feel like, yeah, I can just hang out with Tom Hanks. Yeah, it's a good time. It's easy. We did a lot of these when we were working together, but we did a lot of weird but effective exercises. So I'm curious, just personally, are there weird but effective exercises that one, you have every client do, and two, that you do personally that you swear by? And if you describe them to people, they're going to sound a little bit weird, but they're you do them for a reason. Haha. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I, there are clients out there that would tell you absolutely <laughs> everything I do is weird. <laughs> for sure. I think I mentioned it before, but the laughing and crying is a great one. We Laughter and crying are things that we know how to do. We're born knowing how to do them as babies. We, we can laugh and cry. And it's such a powerful, basic human thing inside us that when you just laugh, just even start with a little chuckle, you know, <laughs> your belly, you can feel your belly connecting with your breath. (laughs) And it's the same thing with a cry. It's the same mechanism and it's the same placement, you know, (laughs) that belly kicks in, which connects your breath and your voice instantly. 
One of the other things that I love to do is any version of a shimmy or a tremor or a shake. When you shake your voice, you shake loose all this crud. You shake loose a bunch of tension. You shake out. Even if you go get a massage and get off the table, your voice isn't going to be what it is if you shake because you're also infusing energy in the shake. And so just It doesn't have to be anything particularly structured. Just wiggle your whole body. Let your arms and your hands and your head and your jaw and everything shake, 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 shake on a big ah or an oh, and just let all that sound come out. That's one of my favorites. It's super easy. You can do it anywhere, anytime. And it's got like full, full impact. You go from zero to 60. Boom. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us, we don't, unfortunately, don't move our bodies very often during the day either. So it's just, just the simple act of getting your body in motion really helps. Truly, truly the sedentary, especially now that we're all at home and we're staring at Zoom screens, we're not even walking down the hall for the next meeting. We're just, so yeah, definitely get up every hour, stretch, shake, breathe, yawn, cry, laugh. So one thing that, yeah, that I want to touch on is for someone listening that they are probably feeling how I felt before working with you, which is they don't have confidence in their voice. They probably don't find it particularly appealing or they just, I think my experience with it was you don't get to choose your voice. You just, it is there. And for most of us, we never learn like a lot of things in life, how to harness it or how to think about it. And yet it's something we use all the time to communicate Mm -hmm. our emotion, to try to compel people to believe in something that we believe, to connect in intimate ways with our significant other. And so your voice is super important. So for someone listening that maybe has that same sense of, I maybe don't probably particularly like my voice. I want to start making, maybe just start with one simple little step to begin their own journey of improving their voice. Is there a book, a course, a video on YouTube that you would direct somebody to, or maybe it's just an exercise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of really good voice books. Voice books, though, are really difficult to read if you haven't already done voice work. (laughs) The voice books that are out there, they will describe the voice exercises, but I think it's really better to have practical Mm -hmm. instruction. If you've had some practical instruction, then maybe go back and read the book. It's got good reminders, adjustments for techniques, and good exercises. There is, of course, my YouTube video that has four exercises that's like you see me demonstrating them, super easy to do, great place to start. They're very basic exercises. As for courses, yes. And actually, right now in the pandemic is a brilliant time because voice classes are online when they aren't normally. Usually you'd have to go to New York or LA or London. And right now, everybody's doing them online. So absolutely, but be careful, be judicious about who you're choosing. The Linklater Center in Orkney is doing some online right now. Make sure that you're choosing certified teachers. There's a ton of stuff on YouTube that I look at it and I think, oh my gosh, I hope people aren't doing this. So just make sure that you're choosing, whether it's Feldenkrais or Alexander Technique or Patsy Rodenberg or Linklater or whomever, make sure that you're finding somebody who's a certified teacher. If it's YouTube or you're signing up for a class, sign up through an organization that is reputable But right now is a great time to do a course online because things are accessible and available right now that normally are not. So yeah, the course options are great. I took last week a Linklater course that was taught by a woman in Mexico and another woman in Chile. And I wanted to just throw out like a few things that I picked up in my own research and experience that you didn't recommend. I just want to be super clear. You didn't recommend these, but I thought I would throw them out and I will link to everything that you just shared in the show notes. So thanks for all those. But I figured I would just throw in a couple mm-hmm. more. You talked a lot about warm ups. One of the things that you particularly gave me were a few tongue twisters that I can do, which were super helpful. One book that I found that's in that same vein that I don't know even now, there's probably been a hundred copies of it purchased ever, but I love it. And it's just super fun to do. And it's a great way to warm up your voice. It's just tongue twisters. And Rodney Salisbury has a great book called Tongue Twisters and Vocal Warmups that it's almost like you can flip to any page and just give something a try. And it's a good way to warm it up. And then another one that is a little difficult, but it's a device called a bone prop. And it's for all intensive purposes, like a 
tiny little bone. It's not an actual bone, but it's like a tiny little bone shape that you put in between your top and bottom teeth. And you use it to try to just work on enunciation. And basically, at least I'll just describe my experience with it. You sound ridiculous when you put it in. And it makes it just much harder to try to have clear enunciation. And so the kind of idea is you can warm up with that. And if you're able to do it in this more difficult way with this bone prop in, then it should carry over to your regular speech. So those are two things that I picked up. Is there any, do you have anything to add to that? Or is there any products you would recommend? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's great what you just said about the bone prop. If you can run a marathon, you can run around the block with no problem. This is why it's so important to do your daily exercises if you're a professional voice user or if you just want to use your voice better in your life, to work on it daily, to train. You have to train. And when you create these impediments for yourself to make it harder, like a bone prop or sticking out your tongue to read your copy, it's kind of remarkable how easy it is afterwards it's sort of mind-blowing. I mean, for me, everybody's got their phrase or their word that they hate, right? For me, it's digital editor. (laughs) Don't make me say digital editor. But you stick your tongue out and say it. And then digital editor is suddenly so much easier and the articulation is so much lighter. So yes, props to the bone prop or just sticking your tongue out. And I was wondering, what's your favorite tongue twister? You said there are a couple that you love to do. It's, uh, yeah, great, great way to put me on the spot here. Let me see. So I actually have it right here. (laughs) I mean, they're just really fun. Just to share, the way that I typically do them is I just do them in the car. So I commute about half an hour each way. And so one of the things that I just started doing when we started working together is I would just do a couple tongue twisters in the car. And, you know, I guess my thought or something I always try to incorporate into some area that I want to improve is my personal experience has been if I just go for it and try to find things that I enjoy or things that feel more like play or things that feel more like a game, it just makes it so much easier to do. And so, yeah, one that I like doing is, and these all come right from that Rodney Salisbury book is, it's called Bippity Bumpity, but it's just Bippity Bumpity, Rippity Rumpity, Rippity Bimpity Boo, Bippity Bumpity, Rippity Rumpity, Let's Make It Harder to Do, Bumzity Rumzity, Dumzily Clumzily, Hopefully Soon We'll Be Through, with Bippity Bumpity, Rippity Rumpity, Stop When Your Pink Tongue Turns Blue. And that's one of like a five or six sequence. And then as you progress, you try to do those faster, you try to connect them together. And that is, I will say, very easy. And there are some inside there that are just incredibly difficult to, to do. So it's fun. It's a fun way to try to get better at it, work on technique. Let me say one thing about that, because when you said it's more fun for you to do it when you feel like you're playing, I mean, that is the key to everything. No matter what these exercises are, if you can treat them like play, if you can play with them, if you can have that attitude of being playful, not only does it make the work more fun, but it makes the work better. It improves the quality of the work that you do when you approach it with a playful attitude you are more relaxed, you're more released. And so the work happens deeper and it happens more fully because you've released all this intensity of focus and concentration. (laughs) Yeah. And you're more present. I feel like a lot of us are just on the surface and, you know, you need to try to find ways to engage a little bit more fully all of your senses and engage emotionally. And yeah, it feels like a helpful way to do that. Truly. Well, thank you so much for coming on, for talking about something that I know I was fascinated. I feel so fortunate to work with you or to have worked with you, you know, and I feel like this is an area that I think a lot of people struggle with and a lot of people would benefit from getting proper instruction. So thank you so much for being so generous, for coming on and for sharing at least some of your your secrets. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk about this wonderful work and to help people understand that, yeah, they're not locked into the sound that they have. You know, you can grow and you can change and you can make choices about how you want to sound and and how you want to express yourself. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to anything and everything mentioned in this episode, please go to outliers.fm. If you enjoyed this episode, sign up for my weekly newsletter. You'll be the first to hear about new episodes before they're released, and you'll get the best quotes, themes, and ideas from each episode in a weekly update I call Inside the Episode. To sign up for that, just go to outliers.fm slash newsletter. Just two more things before you take off. Number one, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in iTunes. 
My amazing team and I invest countless hours planning, researching, and editing each episode because we want all of them to be amazing. And we hope you enjoyed listening. If you did, please consider taking 30 seconds to leave a short review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Reviews are crucial in helping us get the best guests and helping more people find outliers. So if you have 30 seconds, please take a moment and leave a short review. Thank you so much. Number two, if you haven't already, sign up for my Friday Five newsletter. Each Friday, you'll get a short email where I share the coolest things that I've been using, loving, and pondering each week. Those include new products I'm trying, supplements I'm experimenting with, people I've been studying, books and articles I've been enjoying, and so much more. It's super short, it's filled with awesome and interesting stuff, and it's a great way to get inspired each week as you head into the weekend. To get access, go to friday5.email. That's F-R-I-D-A-Y-F-I-V-E dot email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.